Tonight on Politicat, Justin Trudeau takes the cake, the results of the Canadian election. Massive strikes at GM and by the Chicago Teachers Union. We look at today's major labor movements. Plus, an in-depth discussion of the Syrian conflict with a Northwestern expert. All that more tonight on Politicat. It's your politics right, right now. now. Good evening and welcome to Politicat. I'm Justin Sweetwood. And I'm Joey Safchik. Lots to cover tonight, so let's dive right in. Prime Minister Justin Trudeau's centre-left Liberal Party won the most seats in the Canadian parliamentary election last night. However, after losing 20 seats overall, they're now short of a majority in Parliament, meaning they're going to have to form a minority government with other parties. And in Israel, former Defense Forces Chief of Staff Benny Gantz and his centrist party are now in a similar position, attempting to form a minority government. Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu tried and failed to form a government earlier this month. If Gantz succeeds, it will be the first time in a decade that someone other than Netanyahu has been Prime Minister. Last week, Acting Chief of Staff Mick Mulvaney contradicted President Trump's assertion that there was no quid pro quo during the controversial July phone call with Ukrainian President Volodymyr Zelensky, saying that they, quote, held up the money due to DNC hacking by foreign nationals in the 2016 election. After pushback from the administration, Mulvaney later walked his comments back, saying that, quote, the president never told me to withhold any money. And earlier today, according to his leaked opening statement, U.S. Ambassador to Ukraine Bill Taylor testified to congressional committees that administration officials told him the money was held up pending an announcement of a Ukrainian investigation into the Bidens. On Friday, Mayor Lori Lightfoot proposed a plan that would more than triple the taxes on Uber and Lyft rides for single passengers, as well as rides to and from downtown. Her proposal has faced criticism as it would include neighborhoods outside of the loop, which don't contribute to the congestion problem the taxes aim to solve. Lightfoot says the goal of this plan is to reduce traffic by incentivizing carpools. She also predicted it would generate $40 million in revenue that would help fill in the 2020 budget. Over the weekend, British Prime Minister Boris Johnson revised Brexit agreement. Uh, his revised Brexit agreement was narrowly rejected. This forces Johnson to ask for yet another extension on Brexit, which he is reluctant to do. Those who voted against the plan expressed concerns of vulnerability post-Brexit. According to the New York Times, Johnson has stated that he does not feel, quote, daunted or dismayed by this result and will be pushing for another vote on the matter early next week. We don't need to tell you that labor unions are in the headlines this week, both here in Chicago and across the country. The Chicago Teachers Union has been on strike since October 17th. Public schools in the city were closed for the fourth day today. The union is demanding more teachers and support staff, including nurses and counselors. They also want smaller class sizes and affordable housing. But this isn't the only high profile strike we should mention. Workers at General Motors are spending a sixth week on the picket lines. The United Auto Workers Union is asking for changes in their pay and are protesting against the closure of five GM factories in the U.S. That's right, Joey, and several 2020 candidates have met with the Auto Workers Union. Senator Elizabeth Warren visited the striking CTU teachers this morning. And to discuss this more, I'd like to welcome in our panel Cameron Peters of the Northwestern College Democrats and Sachin Shukla of Northwestern Political Union. So Cameron, I'm going to start with you here. Some experts have suggested that these strikes are happening even though the economy is strong because workers feel like they can demand more. What do you make of that? Um, yeah, I, so I, I think the economy is strong if you look at the top line numbers, but in reality, wages have not necessarily been rising for these teachers, even as cost of living is going up. And they're not just striking for themselves, they're not just striking um, to be paid more, they're striking for their students. So. Um, indifferent in the economy, they want to see more funding for things like um, pre-K and early childhood education, um, for school nurses, for school programs, um, classroom supplies. So I think the economy is only a small part of the reason we're seeing um, all this labor activism right now, and there's a lot more to it. Do you think it's a small part, as Cameron said? So I think that the top line number, I think it is actually mostly the economy and rela factors related to it, but I think the top line numbers have very little to do with it. So the two strikes you mentioned, CTU, which is a public, you know, it's CPS, a public 
uh, department, which is funded by some government. So probably what's causing, so Chicago, as you know, has a massive budget hole, a, like $883 million or something like that. And that's, going, that's uh, caused in large part by the bad Illinois tax code and, the, um, and uh, pension liabilities, underfunded pension liabilities that are a result of demographic changes, aging, uh, an aging electorate, aging citizenry, which is a big economic trend. And as far as GM goes, uh, one of the things they were protesting was the relocation of the factories, right? That's a big globalization thing. It's also caused by just the fact that the United States economy is transferring away from manufacturing. So I think the economy actually is a big part of it. You just have to look a bit more carefully to see what the economy is doing that's causing all these strikes. And speaking of the economy, do you think that this is an indicator that workers are feeling frustrated with wage inequality more generally? Yes. I think that seems to be the, the dominant narrative is that um, Although like something like wages are not keeping up with productivity, uh, the growth has not been equitably distributed, and I think um, I, I, again I think the issues with uh, globalization that's been a big part of that. Certainly a big part of what uh, put Trump in the White House anyway. Yeah, I absolutely agree. Um, yeah, when you drill down, um, the economic numbers do have a little more to say, but. Um, I do think that uh, putting it all in the economy distracts um, distracts from the really real issues in the classrooms. Um, it's just a, a matter of money in some cases, and I think that's why we're seeing so many candidates um, out in the field with uh, with these um, labor movements. I mean, Elizabeth Warren and Bernie Sanders have been in Chicago supporting the CTU strikes. Um, they both pledged to spend a lot more money federally on education um, should they be elected president, and I think that's kind of a story to keep watching. And Cameron, President Trump promised more jobs to manufacturing workers when he was campaigning in 2016, specifically to auto workers. Do you think he's going to lose any of his base come 2020 due to their dissatisfaction right now? I think it's very possible. A lot of his policies, um, both towards auto workers and towards uh, much of the industrial Midwest and the agricultural Midwest, have really been doing them no favors. Um, the USMCA, which is his uh, NAFTA replacement trade deal that he's been pushing hard to get through Congress and ratified. Um, it's already been ratified in Mexico and I think Canada, but don't quote me on that. Um, so that is not at all friendly to, um, to these auto workers who are striking. That will not do anything to um, keep companies like GM in the Midwest or to bring back the plants that have already left. So we, um, yeah, I can't think that'll be helpful for him. Do you think this is going to have any impact on yeah, President Trump's 2020 prospects? Yeah, I do. I think that was a dumb promise to make because I think the manufacturing jobs are not coming back. They have not been coming back for the past 30 years, and frankly, they don't think they should come back. Uh, I think the transformation of the U U.S. economy is just what happens as the country develops, and we need to be we need to adjust to that in order to get the windfalls. Um, most of I've been look I've been seeing the trends in those Rust Belt states like Wisconsin, Michigan, Pennsylvania, and so on, and they're not promising for him. Uh, I've heard some rumors that Ohio might be in play as well. And do we think that workers' rights will continue to develop as a priority in the Democratic field as we get closer to the election? Yes, absolutely, I think so. Um, as, as you just said, um, the, the Midwest, the Rust Belt states are absolutely in play, um, particularly Michigan, Wisconsin, were obviously central in 2016 and will be central in this election. So it really um, it behooves candidates on both sides to make those issues a focus of their races, um, even in Ohio, potentially. Um, Iowa could be in play, so I imagine we'll see a lot of that um, from both sides going forward. Uh, yeah, I think so. It looks like the two front runners are Biden and Warren. Biden is, in, is in, a, in his own words, a union man, and uh, unions also seem to be a big part of Warren's push as well. I think if the front runners were someone like Harris or Buttigieg, I wouldn't necessarily say that's the case because they tend to get their votes, especially Pete, from a college-educated. Uh, wealthier uh, millennial liberals, uh, which don't necessarily fit the profile of the union workers, but I think with either Biden or Warren in, in the front, uh, yeah, I think unions are going to be front and center. What do you think, what do you make of Warren showing her face at the CTU rally today? It's just a campaign, you know, it's just a campaign stunt. I don't, I don't put too much, too much value on it. I think uh, I it's, it's also striking because the new mayor, Laura Lightfoot, she is, uh, she was perceived as sort of a break from the past, sort of a, a new fresher face, which I think could easily have been spun to, to put her in alignment with Warren. So I think it's, you know, it's just she took, saw the opportunity and she took it. Would you describe this as a strategic campaign stunt, Cameron? Um, I think it's 
strategic, yes, everything in a campaign is, but I don't know if I would dismiss it as a stunt. I mean, this is, as I think, something Elizabeth Warren really believes. She, um, she's come from a very much a middle class, working class background. She talks about that on the campaign trail, her family in Norman, Oklahoma. Um, so she knows what it's like, and I think she really does care about these causes. Um, she's a teacher. She cares about education, and she knows what it's like. So it's good for her campaign. Um, it was planned, but I don't think it's just a stunt. I think it's something that um, she cares about and wants to make front and, front and center um, a part of her, her campaign. All right, we'll have to leave it right there. We'll be back after this break. Western, we're wildcats in every way. The relationship between Democrats and Facebook, well, we all know it's complicated. For more, we turn to Justin with this week's Money Minute. Thanks, Joey. Elizabeth Warren has made headlines when she intentionally published a false advertisement on Facebook, saying that Facebook CEO Mark Zuckerberg had endorsed Donald Trump for re-election. The ad continues to say that that wasn't true, but it might as well be, after Facebook allowed President Trump's team to publish an ad making false claims about Vice President Joe Biden and his son, Hunter. Warren insists that Facebook needs to be broken up, and it has proved to be especially influential in politics. Just take the 2020 Democratic candidate's campaign spend spending on the social media juggernaut as an example. The 19 current Democratic candidates have spent $32 million on Facebook ads from March 24th to October 5th, which is more than they spent on TV ads. Warren herself has poured millions of dollars into her own Facebook crusade. This campaign cycle is the first time when Facebook is publicly releasing who is purchasing ads and even more interesting, who they're being directed at. Bernie Sanders has spent almost $500,000 targeting people aged 13 to 24, while Joe Biden has put in a meager $12,000, less than one half of 1% of his Facebook spending, perhaps a cause of concern. And compare that to Andrew Yang, who has the greatest proportion of ads directed towards a younger audience. But back to Biden here, the vice president's spending has been more focused on middle-aged users, especially women. And with the primaries approaching, whoever controls Facebook might have an extra edge, certainly a unique and 21st century-esque advantage. Joey? Thanks, Justin. To unpack that a little more, we'd like to welcome back our panel. Now, the data Justin just talked about shows that most candidates' money is going towards people who are older than 25. We're not the demographic. Does this say more about Facebook users or about who these candidates expect to vote for them? Um, I think it's a little bit of both. Um, yeah, Facebook users are older. It's not uh, our generation's social media platform to a large extent. So that's who they're trying to reach on the platform. Um, but additionally, especially when you look at um, the Iowa caucuses, which is a really uh, time-heavy um, process for selecting a um, nominee caucusing, um, it's an older generation that's going to show up on a cold Iowa night in February and take the time to support their candidates. It's not going to be overwhelmingly college students, um, people in our age range, so it makes a lot more sense for these candidates to be focusing on um, uh, older generation. I think the other thing to consider here is that older people tend to vote at a higher rate than younger people, so that's probably why they're targeting them. Do you think if they turn to Snapchat or Instagram, they'd be able to increase their 18 to 25 year old turnout? That's interesting. I, ju I don't know how they would do it on Snapchat or Instagram. Um, but they might be able to. 
I think they also just might be trying to, I think Twitter is also a big thing, and I think they also just may, might be tailoring who they're targeting differently. Another thing to consider is that some people are betting on the early states, namely Pete Buttigieg, he's betting on Iowa and New Hampshire. Same thing with Steyer, like he's bought like 15,000 you know, spots, TV spots in Iowa uh, to essentially buy his way into the debates. Um, so that, that's, also, that's also a variable as well. And I do see plenty of Mayor Pete on my Instagram yeah. feed telling me that I can go see Hamilton with, with his husband. With Chastin, yeah. So <laughs> I do think that some of them are grasping onto that. Yes. Now, Sachin, you mentioned billionaire philanthropist Tom Steyer. He did just get into the race, but he spent considerably more on Facebook than anyone else, yeah. probably because he's a billionaire. But do you honestly think that that could propel him to a leading position? Uh, I think it I think the point of that was to get him onto the debates, which did leave some people confused. I saw someone on Twitter uh, after the debate was like, no, seriously, who is Tom Steyer and how did he wander onto the, the debate stage? Uh, so that was pretty funny. Um, I think he's just, I, I, especially in a, in a race with 19 candidates, uh, you have to be realistic. I think he's just trying to get his message onto, onto the debate stage in the same way as I think people like Young are thinking, as well as Mike Gravel. Uh, they're, who's, like, they didn't do any ground advertising at all. Their whole point was to get onto the debate stage. And Cameron, I want to circle back to Joe Biden here yeah. for a minute. Even though Facebook tends to target an older demographic, what do you make of Joe Biden only spending $12,000 on this younger demographic when other candidates have spent significantly more? Well, I haven't seen all the numbers. Frankly, as far as I know, Joe Biden is running a very old school campaign. He has a lot of Democratic establishment working for his campaign. He is of the Democratic establishment. And that is a very um, TV first, ground game first approach to politics. Um, campaigns like Pete Buttigieg's have a, um, a digital first strategy where digital advertising is really um, interwoven into every aspect of their campaign. Rather than having a dedicated digital team, they have it woven through all levels of their campaign. So Facebook is naturally more their territory. Instagram is more their territory. Um, in particular, with Joe Biden's spending on that demographic. I don't think that he thinks he needs that group to win. That's not part of his path forward. Um, he's, as you said, he's a union man. He has really, really strong um, African American support in South Carolina. Um, so he's looking at a very particular demographic, um, and it's not young people. Do we think that the tradition of attack ads that we've seen since television hit the scene is going to find a way to adapt to social media? Yeah, so I th at least on Twitter, based on what happens is journalists or people who are interviewing candidates will just fi find the attack lines, post them, or even the campaign staff. So like th those attack lines will get out there somehow. And just really quickly, Sachin, how important are overall ads for candidates in general, or is their message mainly sp uh, spread through these debates that we're seeing on TV? Uh, I think ads are probably more important. Um, yeah, the debates are they're, they're certainly a flawed format. They're not that long. A candidate can, and they're also just like you know, you only have sixty seconds to speak, and you're you're not given the, the chance to talk on whatever you want. So I think ads give the candidate much more flexibility. They can do it over a much longer time frame. They can there's a lot more time and flexibility there. Cameron, do you put more weight on ads or debates? That's a good question. I I think it's got to be ads. I agree with Sachin. Um, it's. Um, yeah, it's a chance for them to bypass the filters of other candidates trying to talk over them and go straight to the people they're interested in. You can target ads, um, like we saw with Facebook, to particular demographics, not just whoever happens to have tuned into that channel. Um, and that's going to be the path forward for a lot of these candidates, especially, um, especially in the social media age when you have 1.5 billion daily active users on Facebook. All right, we'll have to leave it there. We'll be back. At Northwestern, we're wildcats in every way. Go you Northwestern, fight for nature, 
sweet victory spread for the fame of our fair name and go northwestern wind that game. Go Cats! At Northwestern University, we are pioneering innovation and achieving excellence across every imaginable discipline. Western University, the possibilities are endless. Welcome back to Politicat. We're continuing our coverage of the conflict in Syria this week. I sat down with Northwestern's own Danny Postel, Assistant Director of the Weinberg Program in International and Area Studies. We discussed the Kurds, Turkey, and where we go from here. This is human suffering on a colossal scale that shouldn't be happening, doesn't need to be happening, and that we as Americans are in some sense implicated in. I wouldn't use the term genocide, but ethnic cleansings, uh, ethnic engineering uh, is, 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 is already happening. I think the biggest misconception is that the driving force behind the conflict in the Middle East today is what's sometimes called ancient sectarian hatreds or ancient ethnic hatreds. I think this is a nonsensical and deeply ahistorical way of making sense of what's happening in the Middle East. But it also allows the West to wash its, its hands, you know, engage in critical um, analysis of what's going on, but also to reach out to the people of the region themselves, many of whom have communities here in Chicago. In Washington, D.C., a cohort of bipartisan senators wants the Senate to vote on legislation reining in a president's emergency powers. The Hill reports the senators want to reestablish, quote, the appropriate checks and balances between the Congress and the executive. Under the National Emergencies Act, Congress can force a vote on the president's emergency declaration every six months. And we've spent the better part of two weeks, not to mention the last eight years and just a few moments ago on this show, talking about the crisis in Syria. Well, I want to bring to your attention one woman who's working to help the embattled nation rebuild. Leila Mustafa is the co-chair of the Civil Council of Raqqa, which was at one point the capital of the Islamic State. Well, ISIS left the Syrian city in a state of ruin, and Mustafa is one of the closest people Raqqa has to an acting mayor. In a city where just a few years ago women were severely subjugated, Mustafa is leading the charge to restore normalcy. And now to Puerto Rico, two high-ranking Department of Housing and Urban Development officials admitted at a congressional hearing that they knowingly missed a deadline that would have made funding available to hurricane-ravaged Puerto Rico. It's been two years since Hurricane Maria hit the island, which has received about a third of the money Congress allocated toward recovery efforts, according to NBC News. Plus, right here in Evanston, a teacher at a local school is speaking up, saying they face transphobia and harassment in the workplace since coming out as transgender three years ago. Ren Heckathorn says they've been urging the Evanston Skokie School District to implement policy protecting faculty from discrimination based on gender identity. This comes the same month the Supreme Court heard arguments over whether transgender people have protections at work. I sat down with Heckathorn. Watch that interview on Facebook.com slash NNNTV. And to end the show on a fun note, we're bringing back a game from last quarter called Head Lies. So here's how it works to our panel. We're going to read you three headlines. Two of them are fake. One of them is real. You guys have to guess which one of them is real. Are you guys ready? We're going to play two rounds. All right. All right, Joey's going to start it off. All right, so here is round one. <coughs> First, in an attack on the impeachment inquiry, a Republican congressman said the inquiry was an effort by House Democrats to steal back the 2016 election, quote, just like when the House stole the presidency for John Quincy Adams over Andrew Jackson in 1824. Taking it way back there, 1824. If it's not in Hamilton, I don't know it. Second, Chicago Police Superintendent Eddie Johnson has requested an investigation into himself after he was found asleep in his squad car at a stop sign at midnight earlier this week. And finally, third, according to spokespeople, this week Elon Musk has called several Democratic campaigns to try to start public arguments after seeing the publicity Facebook and Mark Zuckerberg got from their little ruffle with, ruffle, tuffle, with Elizabeth Warren. Let's see. Um, <laughs> I think of those three, the Elon Musk headline is the lie. Oh. Two lies, one Two lies, okay, Two lies sorry. One, yeah. It's the, the opposite. The correct headline then would be the Republican. 
I believe, um, and John Quincy Adams. It's a tough one. Just a Hail Mary guess. I'm just going to go with uh, the police chief. It's probably true. The police chief is true. Got to stay up on your local news. Yeah. yeah, if it's Elon Musk, we probably made it up. You, you threw him in we last always time, have too. Elon yeah, Musk we is always a have regular Elon staple Musk. Yep. in headlines. He really yep. is. It's not politicatic. There's no Elon Musk. Low right. hanging fruit. Are you ready? Yeah. Now we're going to go for round two. You have another two. chance. There we go. Okay, first. Former presidential candidate and current senator from Utah, Mitt Romney, has a fake Twitter account under the pseudonym Pierre Delecto, on which he has only 10 tweets. Second, following a heart attack on the campaign trail, Bernie Sanders said he is willing to, quote, work himself to death to win the presidency. And third, after his poor performance at a CNN town hall on LGBTQ plus issues, Joe Biden tried to win back favor with LGBT voters, responding to a question about whether President Trump should be impeached with the response, quote, Yas Queen. <laughs> oh. I'm glad we turned back to national news. That's more in my um, area <laughs> of expertise. I am happy to report that Mitt Romney does in fact have a Twitter account with the name Pierre Delecto. Do you know how they... Yes. Uh, Did you have a guess? Oh, uh, who doesn't yeah, know about... you're happy <laughs> to report. <laughs> who, who? you say you're happy to report, it kind of gives it away. <laughs> I mean, you're who, giving who away the advantage, Cameron. You can, you can you don't see know. into our control room through the glass, yeah. and our producer who came up with this was going like this, so I think that might have given it away. That, now the only <laughs> thing you could do is hope for a tie. I mean, who, who doesn't know about Pierre Delecto? Like, I, I've, I've been confused. I woke up very confused going through my Twitter feed one day because uh, pretty much every person I follow somehow... Uh, so first, for the month of October, they changed their name to something like Spooky. And then now they've added, like, the Pierre Delecto layer onto it. So this one person just went to, like, Pierre Delecto's book sale. I'm just like, who, who is Pierre Delecto? Well, he doesn't and have much to say. Out. Only ten <laughs> tweets. He doesn't have much to say. We and may think we know who he is, but... I oh, love the story of how they found it through some good investigative journalism <laughs> slash social media stalking. Yeah, uh, Ashley Feinberg of Slate, who um, is kind of a prodigy at social media stalking members of Congress. Um, she's done this before. I think she found James Comey's Reinhold Niebuhr. It's a special skill. Yeah, Reinhold Niebuhr um, Twitter account. Yeah, she combed through his tweets, found who he was following, what he's liked, looked at who he's replied to. Um, he has 10 tweets, but he has a lot more replies, often defending uh, Mitt Romney. So, um, yeah, some social media sleuthing, and ta-da. And it's been confirmed by his office since then. So. All right, and if that wasn't good enough, uh, he confirmed it in French. Yes, he did. this is true. <laughs> All right, we have to cut it off there. <laughs> we'll be back after this break. At Northwestern, we're wildcats in every way. On Thursday, President Trump completed his 1,000th day in office. The almost three years since he's taken office have been a whirlwind of legislation, appointments, and controversies. For tonight's final word, we're taking a look at some of the highlights of the last 1,000 days. That's right, Joey. And notably, the president has overseen two Supreme Court confirmations, Neil Gorsuch in 2017 and Brett Kavanaugh in 2018. These nominations pushed the court further right. On policy, the president has not passed comprehensive health care or immigration reform, two key aspects of his campaign. However, he did pass a new tax plan back in December 2017 that cut income taxes and taxes on corporation. He's also faced significant criticism for his policy on family separation of immigrants at the southern border and for retracting Obama-era environmental protections. And no overview of the Trump presidency would be complete without mention of the investigation into Russian interference, the current impeachment inquiry, or his seemingly constant controversies with the media and other groups he deems his enemies. Those topics have dominated coverage of this presidency. Is that an effect of the media's choices or of the quality of Trump's administration? 
That'll depend on who you ask. But with a thousand days behind us, we're getting a better idea of how this term will be remembered in history. That's all the time we have for tonight. For all of us here at Politicat, I'm Joey Safchik. And I'm Justin Sweetwood. Thanks for watching. Good night.